Jesus, your room was uh, the room is full. Normally, I sit at the front, but All right, so welcome to class three. This is really, really cool. This is my first time with you guys, uh, which is kind of neat. I remember the very first time we did this in 2010. We had six total students, and I guess now we have like 300, I mean, given this and everybody online, so that's really, really cool. I want to say a special thank you to Brad for filling in last week. Uh, I was out both times, obviously, because you guys didn't see me. I'll be here most of the time, I think, going forward, which is kind of cool. What I try to do with all the material is explain it in a way that it makes sense to me. What? Turn your webcam on. You turn your webcam on. I told you, I even warned you. And you have to move your little slider thing. Son of a... Security is a lot of work, you guys. Oh, that's me? <laughs> You can close that. <laughs> Looks all right. I can close that. You, you don't have to look at yourself. I found it very distracting to look at myself. All right. Absolutely. So we're going to go through, uh, you're going to give them a rundown of who I am. You guys know who I am? I run uh, FR Secure. We founded FR Secure in 2008. I've uh, been doing security for a really long time, like 25 years. Uh, still loving it still doing it. Uh, I love teaching. I love mentoring. I love helping. Uh, we call it growing unicorns. So I'm hoping that, you know, whatever walk of life you guys are in today or whatever you do today, you know, if you want to get into security, if you're not already in this field, uh, I hope we can really help you do that. I mean, we have a severe shortage of unicorns in our industry and we need more uh, I don't feel challenged or threatened by that at all. There's plenty of business for all of us to do. So even if you work for, you know, a competitor of FR Secure, I still welcome you. You know, hopefully we can work together and, you know, solve some of these big problems we have in the industry. So, so far we've gone through, well, let's go to the next slide. So far we've gone through, um, well, maybe I will. We've gone through uh, chapters one and two. Chapter was one was just the introduction. Chapter two was kind of your first material. Uh, and I know there were some good questions uh, last week. I like questions. I like You don't have to wait for me to open up and say, hey, any questions? If you have questions, I'm an informal guy. You can raise your hand. We have a lot of material to get through. Um, it's pretty dry, right? Have you guys, how many people have read the first couple of chapters? Pretty exciting read so far. Riveting. Anybody read chapter three yet? Okay. And chapter four? Okay. Chapter four is really fun. So we talk about security models, and none of those security models you'll ever use. You know, you'll need to know them for the exam, and then you can kind of dump a lot of that information later on. The concepts are really important. Uh, this still drives home, you know, things like confidentiality and integrity. So we'll talk about Bella Padula. That's a confidentiality model. BIBA is an integrity model. 
the way you can tell the difference between those two, they're kind of the opposites of each other, and we'll get to this. Biba's got an I in it. Biba, integrity. The other one's confidentiality, right? That's the way I've always kind of remembered it. Uh, so we've gotten through the first two chapters. Any questions I can answer for you guys now from what you guys have read so far, or anything we've covered? Anything on anything online? How do they think I look? Uh, pretty. Real? It's pretty. This is the comment. <laughs> About that. Looking great. I also try to make this. You looking great. I try to make this uh, entertaining too, because it's kind of dry, man. And honestly, you can the way I passed the CISSP exam, I took the CISSP in 2003, maybe. And uh, the way I did it is I just read the book three times. I read the book the first time, didn't understand the damn thing I was reading. I read it the second time, and concepts started to form. And then I read it the third time, and the third time I really focused on memorization and mastery. So truly, everything you need to pass the exam in the book the good thing about having kind of the class is there's some structure to it. Hopefully you make some uh, uh, relationships. You guys can form some study groups maybe, uh, bounce some ideas. You can also, uh, it sets aside time every week for you to go through this because I'm a procrastinator too. So I would schedule my test like in June and I'd start studying in like June. Right? That's not the healthy way to do this. So. Can we share all our personal information? Do you want me to? I can do that. I can do anything. I'm a security guy. We got the. Yeah, we can do that. If you if you yeah. prefer, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe well, we, we said that we have CISSP mentor at FR Secure, and that goes to both of us, and we'll add in some additional people. So that way you're not waiting on Kevin or I because we can sometimes get busy. But you can always email that, and we'll, one of us will get to it. I think that's probably two and a half mothers in there. Was that there's an email address set up? Yep. That, that's what you're talking about. Yes, okay. Did you mean getting like everybody here's information so that we can run study groups? Why well, anybody here and anybody online? I mean, I think if you're interested in study group, maybe just email that that <clears throat> email address, whatever it is, and just put study group in the subject line, and then we'll uh, accumulate yeah. those and, and distribute it, it yeah. later on. All right. So let's go back to risk analysis. Risk analysis is a really, really, really important thing in information security and in the exam. If you remember our definition from the very first class, it was information security is, does anybody remember? Managing risks, managing risks to confidentiality, integrity, and availability using administrative, physical, and technical controls, right? Sometimes you can flip the controls in the, what you're trying to protect back and forth, but remember the CIA, the AD is the opposite of CIA. There's most people overemphasize technical controls, right? All the money grab that you see in our industry today, $96 billion will be spent on information security this year, estimated. Most of that is in technical controls, right? Blinky lights, I call it the money grab because everybody's entering in this industry right now trying to grab money. A lot of those controls aren't very effective, certainly for missing the basics of what information security really is. What we want to do here is master the basics, the foundation uh, for good information security programs. Risk analysis, I can't manage information security unless I assess or analyze information security. So that's why risk analysis is really, really important. You'll see this on the exam. You'll see assets, vulnerabilities, threats, what risk is. In the book, it's threat times vulnerability. My definition is the likelihood of something bad happening and the impact if it did, right? Threats and vulnerabilities play a role in that. Where there's a vulnerability and no applicable threat, there's no risk. Where there's all the threats in the world, no vulnerability, no risk, right? So there has to be a gap in both uh, an applicable threat and a vulnerability in order for me to have an actual risk, right? So remember, memorize these things uh, because you, you will see it on the exam for sure. I don't know. Once, I, like I took the exam a long time ago. You took the exam how long ago? Three years. Three years ago. Anybody else taken the exam and it's okay if you didn't pass? How long ago was it for you? Three years. Three years. Okay. You saw ALE, ARO, mm -hmm. all this stuff on the exam. I'm sure it's still very applicable. Uh, now, when you see in in the exam, anytime it's human life versus 
any kind of information security, human life is always going to be your answer, right? And most of the, the uh, multiple choice questions, you'll be able to eliminate two right away, and the other two will be kind of a crapshoot. Uh, if one of them is human life, that's the answer, okay? I mean, that's just, that's just a quick quiz tip or test tip. So any questions on assets, vulnerabilities? Vulnerability is nothing more than a weakness. The way we do risk analysis here at FR Secure is we look at controls, a fully implemented control, meaning control that's fully documented, fully mature, uh, fully uh, auditable. That control, there's no gap in that control. So that particular control, there's no weakness. So then it doesn't matter what the threat is, right? And you do that across hundreds, thousands of controls. Where their controls have weaknesses, where there's, uh, we detract from a fully implemented control, that's a gap. Is there an applicable threat to that gap? If there is, we need to assess the risk. And that's how we come up with risk numbers. Does that sort of make sense in kind of layman's terms? All right. Qualitative and quantitative risk analysis, you'll need to know the difference between those two. Qualitative risk analysis is really just using a professional opinions. Uh, most risk analysis is analysis. What's plural for analysis? Analysis what? Analysis. Analysis? That's probably right. Nice. Risk analyses, uh, most of them are qualitative. There really isn't any quantitative. There's some that say that they're quantitative risk analyses, uh, but most of them have to be qualitative because we don't have the hard data to support a quantitative risk analysis. A quantitative risk analysis is hard numbers, oftentimes dollars. So when you see annualized loss expectancy, single loss expectancy, asset value, exposure factor, those are hard numbers. Right? That would indicate that it's a quantitative risk analysis. The problem is you don't know specifically if this is the asset's value or how often this thing is actually going to happen. Uh, that's one of the challenges we have with uh, insurance, cyber insurance, is we don't have a lot of uh, data to support underwriting. Right, So you're seeing the big fluctuations in cyber insurance policies. Uh, that's called actuarial data. They have that on like houses, like houses burning down, they can tell you with some pretty good certainty how often your house would burn down, right? They can't do that as well with data breaches. So that's a, that's a risk matrix, a risk analysis matrix. On one side, you've got uh, the likelihood. The other side, you've got, you know, potential impacts. Where they meet, that's your risk number, your risk score. Right? You do this across many, many, many different risks, and you start to identify a pattern of where your most significant risks are. And, when, and that's where you focus your attention, is where your most significant risks are. Right? I would spend my next information security dollar on my most significant information security risk. That makes sense. Right? So risk analysis is very important. So asset value, these things you'll need to memorize if you don't know them all already. Asset value, everything starts with the equation with asset value. An asset value by itself, so say I have a $100,000, oh, I'm gonna to try to do math, a $100,000 asset value, right? The exposure factor, how much, you know, that gap, potentially the weakness is maybe 20%. So I've got an exposure factor of 0.2, right? Uh, that gives me my annualized loss expectancy of $100,000 times 0.2, $20,000. Right? If I expect this thing to happen three times a year, my annualized loss expectancy now has become $60,000, right? If I have a control to bring that exposure factor down, say, to 10%, but it costs me $80,000, there's not a return on security investment, right? Because at $60,000, I'm only reducing half of that. That's $30,000. That's about how much I could spend on a control. I'm going to spend $80,000 to bring it down 10%. See what I'm saying? You see how that math works? Okay. Uh, so that's what all these letters mean. Exposure factor, that's the percent of asset that's lost during an incident, that's exposed in an incident. Sing, single loss expectancy, uh, that's exposure factor times uh, your asset value. Annualized rate of occurrence, how many times I expect a bad thing to happen, and that gives me my ALE or my annualized loss expectancy. The total cost of ownership for implementing a control is not just the acquisition cost, but also the maintenance cost over time. Annualized, 
That would be giving my total cost of ownership. I'd compare that with my annualized loss expectancy and end up with an ROI. It's not really an ROI, like an, like an IT ROI, where if I buy this thing, I'm going to make more money. So I prefer the term ROSI, return on security investment, which is really an offset of losses. But, you know, you'll see them both ways. Any questions on this? Boring yet? Hell no. It's the best time I've ever had. Are you, are you factoring in the loss of productivity and asset replacement value? Good. Good. Yeah, I don't think the exam will get that detailed, but I would if I was doing that kind of calculation myself in practice. But in real world, we very rarely, if ever, do this. We know how all of us know how to do annualized loss expectancies, but very, very few of us ever actually do it. All right, so risk choices. Risk choices are always made by the business, right? It's not it's not me who makes risk decisions for the business. I'm an information security person. I'm not the right person to make risk decisions. A CEO is, a, is the correct person. A board of directors is the correct person. Uh, even me as a CISO, I'm not the correct person to make risk decisions. I have only four decisions that I can make with a risk. I can accept the risk as is, I can mitigate the risk, I can transfer the risk, or I can avoid it altogether. That's it, there's no other decisions. No decision is an acceptance, right? And this is the same thing we consult our clients on all the time. We do a risk assessment, we go through, determine all these risks, what are we gonna do about it? You make the decision, and then we need to assign it to somebody who's going to do it, and then we need to determine when we're going to do it. And that's called a roadmap in real life. I don't know if you'll see that in the exam, but that's how we use this in real world. Um, and if you're not going to make a decision, we'll just assume that you're going to accept that risk, right? Ideally, you'd have risk acceptance criteria defined for an organization. Has anybody ever seen one of our assessments before? We call it FISA, FISA score. So we do that scale of 300 to 850. Usually we set the acceptable limit at about 660. If you don't know what it is, if you don't have your own, if you haven't defined your own risk acceptance criteria. So then we would define that anything that falls below that acceptable risk threshold should require mitigation, transfer, or avoidance, <clears throat> right? So if we set the bar at 660 and something comes in at a 600, you can accept it, not according to what you've defined for your risk acceptance criteria. You need to make another decision. So you can kind of start getting a business, you know, moving forward and managing risk. So there's other risk assessment. There's a lot of risk management processes. Really, the only one that's mentioned in the book is NIST SP 800-30. Uh, SP is special publication. They're all free. You can go and download these, take a look at them. They're really well referenced. Probably the one special publication that's referenced more than any other is NIST SP 800-53, which is uh, FISMA comes from that. So have you ever heard of FISMA, Federal Information Security Management Act? FISMA drives through uh, SP 800-53, but 800-30 gives these nine steps <clears throat> for how to implement a risk management practice. Characterization, so that's really a, determining what assets we're actually working with. Now, it would make sense that I can't, if, if I'm in charge of information security, that I cannot secure the things I don't know I have, right? So asset management is really, really, really important if I don't even know I have an asset, how can I secure it effectively? So system characterization is kind of that foundational part. It's that first, what systems do I have? And let's put them into kind of asset buckets. Yeah. In your experience, uh, how, how bad is asset management? Mm -hmm. We ask the questions like you uh, Okay, you said something you said. Right? No, I hear you. So repeat your question. Yes, we did. In my experience, how bad is how asset bad management? Asset management? Terrible. What I see is pathetic. Terrible, yep. So there's three types of assets when we consult companies. One is hardware assets. Most companies do a fairly good job of hardware asset management. Flip up these money laptops, you'll see the asset tag, we got those. The next is software assets. So software licensing and software tools that we use. The third, which is most companies just suck at it, is data, right? And those that's the most valuable asset, right? And now you're finding, why are people struggling with GDPR so much? Not that GDPR is really hard to understand. They have no idea where their personally identifiable information is for Europeans. 
right? Because they've been collecting it all these years, they've been moving it all these years, storing it all these years, but they don't know where it all is. So GDPR is a good thing for asset management, should be. But then from there, what are the threats? What are the vulnerabilities? I prefer to do the control analysis first. I told you my methodology is to do controls first and then identify the weakness in the controls and then apply the threats. This is a little bit different. Not that one's better or worse, it's just different, right? All right, so quiz. Yay, quiz. But did I, did I repeat the question right? Yes, I think so. So he's got a poll he's gonna do online for these guys. Ooh. While we're doing the quiz. These are really basic questions, I thought. I took them right out of the book. You know, I'm not that creative. Uh, which of the following would be an example of a policy statement? So A, oh. technology. I know. All right, go ahead. All right. I'll let them see this. Which of the following? Uh, which of the following would be an example of a policy statement? Protect PII by hardening servers. Harden Windows 7 by first installing the pre-hardened OS image. You may create a strong password by choosing the first letter of each word in a sentence and mixing in numbers and symbols. Download the CIS Windows benchmark and apply it. A? Yeah, I agree with that. So what would B be a better example of? I would say that's a standard. Because it, it, procedure would be step-by-step -step instructions. Guidelines would be C is a guideline. You put the word may in there, that's a guideline, right? It's not mandatory. It's compulsory. The right word? It's mm -hmm. pretty sweet. Guidance. Sometimes I get the right word, sometimes I'm not even close. And then download the CIS, that'd be another standard, I think. Uh, because it's, the thing about standards is they're technology specific, but they're not step by step. So if they name Windows 7 or say a security windows, that's something you can use as a clue. Yep. 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 Did you use it? Say that again? If they use a technology like Windows 7 or Windows, it would be a clue that that's a standard. If they put May in there, then that would indicate to me a guideline, not a standard, because standards are mandatory. Yep. Um, on the task, we have to know if something is a standard versus a procedure. Yes. yes. Okay. Yep. So the question was, will in on the test, will I need to know the difference between a standard and a procedure? And the answer is yes. Okay. The difference between standards and procedures is standards are step-by-step -step instructions. You should be able to give a standard to anybody who, I mean, like I know nothing about this system. You should be able to give me a procedure and I should be able to do to something on the system. Whereas a standard would just give the technical requirements. boundaries, essentially. Okay, so be, oh sorry. What? We're good. You're good? Which of the following steps would be taken while conducting a qualitative risk analysis? Calculate the asset value, calculate the return on investment, cal complete the risk analysis matrix, complete the annualized loss expectancy. Right. Hang on, I'm, I'm, I just want to hold on. Let people answer. I want you to do something because I'll read are, are the, time. The, you can start talking through it. Well, it's, I already know the answer. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so calculate asset value. That's hard dollars. That's quantitative. Return on investment, again, hard dollars. Quantitative. C, risk analysis matrix, that's our estimations, that's qualitative. Uh, complete the annualized loss expectancy, again, that's clearly quantitative. So the answer here is C. Yeah. Question three, oh my gosh. Your company sells Apple iPods online and has suffered many denial of service attacks. Your company makes an average $20,000 profit per week and an example DOS attack lowers sales by 40%. Your, you suffer seven DOS attacks on an average year. A DOS mitigation service is available for a subscription fee of $10,000 a month. You have tested the service and believe it will mitigate the attacks. So I assume taking that, that exposure factor of 0.4 to zero. What is the annual rate of occurrence in the above scenario? See? Yep, seven. Did I give enough time? Yeah, really when we do the poll, it just blocks out their entire screen. So, but no. no more. Sorry, guys, online. <laughs> what is the annualized loss expectancy of lost iPad sales due to DOS attacks? So, annualized, we make $20,000 per week. Exposure factor is 0.4. Uh, so, 20, that'd be 8,000. Am I doing this right? No, no. Yeah. 20. 
8,000 uh, per week. What am I thinking here? Annualized yeah. tax expectancy, $20,000 profit per week. Is what? Is what? 8,000? Yes, that's what I'm thinking. 56,000. Right? Math is hard. In front of people, it is. My office is a lot easier. <laughs> All right. So 56000 So uh, is the DOS okay, mitigation yeah. service a good investment? Can you go back? The question was, it didn't come across clearly how you came up with that answer. Oh. Okay. So $10,000 per week times the exposure factor of 0.4 gives us 8000 20000 per week. Yeah, yeah times point four, which is eight thousand. Seven times a year. Fifty-six thousand. Okay. Yep. Okay. So it's a good investment. Uh, well, ten thousand, hundred twenty thousand dollars to save fifty-six thousand. Doesn't seem like a good investment. So the annual to total cost of ownership is higher. So C, right? Okay, an attacker sees a building is protected by security guards and attacks a building next door with no guards. What control combination are the security guards? We know it's physical because they're all physical. Which one? <laughs> Deterrent? Yeah, because it deterred the attacker. Moved on to another control or another target. So physical deterrent. And you'll see a lot of these questions on the exam, if I remember, uh, where they give you a bunch of different scenarios and you have to choose the correct uh, tu tuple. Is that right? Tuple, where you marry two things together. Which of the following proves an identity claim? So you've got identification, authentication, authorization, and accountability. Identification is just my username. Authentication, right, would prove my identity to the system. Lots of different ways to do authentication. That'd be the answer, right? Piece of cake. So you guys all passed. You are now not CISSPs. <laughs> Can you go back really quick to the preventative, detective, yeah, that one. And before I ask you why it would not be physical preventative. Because it didn't prevent an attack. An attack didn't actually take place. If an attack were to take place and it stopped the attack, so if it didn't say the attacker went on to another building, the attacker still tried, and the security guard stopped them, then it would be a preventative control. It prevented the attack. But here, the fact that it made an attacker go somewhere else because there were weaker controls, that would be a deterrent. Yeah. The key is to read it, and it's the best correct answer. Not There, are most, there could be multiple correct, which is the best or the most correct. Most correct, yeah. Yeah, you'll see a lot of those in the multiple choice where you'll be able to eliminate two right off the bat and you'll have to choose the best of the remaining two. Did that one. All right, asset security, protecting security of assets. Easy chapter in theory, difficult in practice. So one of the key points here in this chapter is uh, data classification. Have you ever tried data classification before? Implemented it? Does it yeah, it's tough, man. Uh, it's easy in concept. Theory, writing a data classification policy is easy. It's implementing it. That's the difficult part. And where I see most organizations fail in the implementation of their data classification is they try to do it organization-wide, right? Rather than just taking a narrow focus, take a small chunk, take the easiest chunk in your organization, maybe take the IT share, you know, file share and start assigning you know, classification to that first and then slowly work your way out. A lot of organizations try to train everybody on data owner, data custodian, data user, and try to implement this thing across the entire organization out of the, out of the gate, and that, that it's almost always gonna fail. So small, start small, and don't try to be perfect either. You're gonna suck at it the first few times, just like we all do. Too. Suck, does that offend anybody when I say suck? Not very politically correct, either. I'm a security guy. That's security humor. You guys kind of dead tonight. Did like this, right? Did like this last week? No. I was a lot funnier. You want me to show you my scars? <laughs> I was dancing last time. Yeah. You were dancing? 
Okay. Classifying data, ownership, uh, memory and remnants, data destruction, uh, and determining data security controls. This is a very, you know, like I said, a simple chapter. The next domain, domain three, is kind of funky because that used to be, that one domain used to be three domains. Because in that domain, you've got security models and, and some architecture stuff. You've got physical security and you've got cryptography. Cryptography is my favorite one to teach uh, and to, to do because it's, it's so much history behind cryptography. Um, but this one, this one's pretty straightforward. So if you're in the book, this is page, I think, 81. Uh, classifying data, ownership, memory remnants, data destruction, and determining data security controls is what we're going to go through. These were the terms that you'll need to memorize that are in the book. So if you don't know what these things are, a lot of times you just have to memorize it. You just have to read it and memorize it. So random access memory. The thing about random access memory is once power is removed from a random, random, <laughs> random, random access memory, you lose the integrity of the data. The data goes away. Now, there are some attacks against that. Supposedly, you can uh, deep freeze memory and still get encryption keys out of it if you get it quick enough. But over time, it'll deteriorate and be gone. You don't have to worry about that for to test, I don't think. Remnants is data that persists after you've deleted it, right? You hit delete on something, the data's still there. Uh, you just deleted the entry in the file allocation table. A lot of data recovery tools can easily get that data back. It's not truly gone until it's been overwritten. And even then, in a clean room with a, an electron microscope, you can sometimes get that data back. That's what Kroll does, right? They've got lots of money tied up in data recovery. Well, I don't know how much an electron microscope costs. I'm guessing it's pretty expensive. Should we budget for it? You bet. If you're worried about somebody recovering with an electron microscope, you've probably got other issues that you're That's true. probably more concerned with. That's true. We'll have to start talking about uh, fair cages and yeah. all that stuff, too. So reference monitor. Reference monitor is actually built into the system. Oftentimes, this is built into the kernel. We're not going to go deep into the kernel or reference monitor today, but the reference monitor is the part of the system that enforces the security policy. Uh, once you've configured the security policy in a system, meaning right-click and select permissions and all that other stuff, you're essentially setting up the, the security policy. The reference monitor mediates and enforces all those things. We had the concept of subjects and objects that we talked about last week. Really, the easiest way to differentiate the two is a subject is an active entity, an object is not. Right. So sometimes a subject can be a subject. Sometimes a subject can be an object. It depends on what the subject's doing. Right? Does that make sense? In most cases, the most traditional way to think of it is I'm interacting with the system. I'm a subject. The things that I'm accessing are the objects. Sometimes I open up another object, then it becomes a subject because it opens up another object. That gets a little bit confusing. right? But if you just think of subjects as being active and objects as being passive, they don't do anything, you'll be fine for, uh, for the exam and in, in real life. ROM, read-only memory, the thing about read-only memory is it's non-volatile. It means you take away power, it's still there. It's read-only memory. Uh, there's different types of read-only memory. There's EEPROM, there's EEPROM. We'll talk about those different kinds. The big difference between EEPROM and EEPROM, EEPROM is electrically. We flash the memory electrically. EEPROM, you flash the memory usually with ultraviolet light. So many of us haven't seen EEPROMs before. Most of us interact with EEPROMs, okay? Those are all ROM, read-only memory. Uh, scoping, so just, it just that one's an easy one. It's just basically what what's in scope and what's not in scope for whatever I'm talking about with information security. Uh, in a standard, like ISO standard or COBIT or NIST SP 800-53, whatever other standard you're using, what's in scope, what's not in scope. This applies really, really strictly, maybe is the word I'm looking for. Uh, PCI compliance, anybody do PCI? Yeah, so you've got the cardholder data environment? No, we're uh, SAC compliant, actually, computer accessible. Okay, so it was done correctly. <laughs> I've been happy with the word problem. Why are you laughing? I meant it. <laughs> but the cardholder data environment and PCI compliance, PCI requirements only apply to the cardholder data environment, right? So that's the scope for PCI compliance. So what I need to do is isolate my cardholder data environment so my whole organization isn't the cardholder data environment. We went through that 
intimately. That was fun, right? Yep. So that, that's, a, that's a good, if you've been through that before, then you'll really understand scoping, right? You want to narrow the scope as much as possible. Um, we like isolation. We like compartmentalization. We like segmentation. I like applying strict security controls only to the systems that really need them rather than trying to apply it system-wide. Uh, scoping allows me to do all those things. SSD, solid state drives. Now we used to have uh, in the old magnetic drives, the, the, pl the, sp the plates that spin on a hard drive, uh, that's all magnetic. So I could do things like degauss the drive. I could do things like overwrite every sector of a hard drive or every block of a hard drive. With SSD, none of that stuff works. Right? SSD, there's no, you don't, you can take a magnet all over SSD and it's not going to do anything to the data. It's not magnetic. Right? So we have some challenges when we deal with SSD and data destruction. Right? There are some tools that come with SSD drives that allow you to remove that data, but that's how you have to remove it. Right? Uh, but solid state drives, because everybody's got solid state drives now, uh, really it's just, it's kind of a combination of flash memory uh, and DRAM. Um, really more flash memory, it's non-volatile, so you know, when you remove power, it, it's still there. Uh, and then tailoring, customizing standards for organizations. Everybody knows that information security is not a one-size-fits-all, right? So what's working in my neighbor's company isn't necessarily going to work in my company. The only way it would ever happen that, that security would be the same is if I had the same people, same technology, same physical location, right? Everything would have to be identical because our definition of information security accounts for all those things, right? Is this exciting? I'm super excited. I'm pumped right now. Do I seem pumped? Yeah. Need more. Uh, whatever this is. All right. So classifying data. Data classification schemes are easy. Objects and labels. Objects have labels. Subjects have clearances. So I apply a label to an object, depending upon my clearance, will tell me whether I, you know, so take top secret, for instance. I would apply top secret as a label to a, to a, a piece of data, whatever. And I would need to have top secret clearance, right, in order to access the data. That's one piece. I'd also have to have the need to know, right? So there's that need to know concept. So just because my clearance permits access to that label doesn't mean that I can access that data. I also need to have clearance. Uh, so data classification scheme, objects have labels. Executive order, if you're ever interested in seeing what the classifications are used in the government, that's a link that you can use. Uh, in most companies, we like to keep this simple uh, because it's confusing enough to most organizations. You know, when I if you break it out any more than like three, uh, people get confused. So the three that we like to use is confidential, internal use only, and public. That's That works in, in most cases. Uh, security com compartments. Um, so c com security, security compartment is just taking data and organizing it within a compartment. We'll talk about compartmentalization, I think, maybe tonight. Uh, we'll probably have time to get to the compartmentalization. That's one thing. I need to have access to the compartment, but then I also have to have that need to know. Pretty basic. In military, you're military. Anybody else here been in the military before? Huh? No? Okay. It's because in the military or in government, you would know this better than I would. Because I don't work in the military. I like the military, but I don't work there. Uh, so subjects have clearances, formal approval authorization to specific levels of information. Uh, we don't use this as much in the private sector. Instead, we use what's called role-based access control. More often than not, it's really common to find no record whatsoever of who gave access to what in an organization, right? So there's a lot of work to be done in the private sector here. And actually, that's one of the struggles that we have when we hire somebody from, from the military or the government and they start working in the private sector, it's culture shock. It's like, what do you mean? There's who, what? The rule says this, you've got to be doing this and there needs to be authorization. So they, they do a much better job of this, you know, typically uh, in the government, but we don't do much here in the private sector, not as much as we should. Uh, and there's the, the form uh, 86, if you want, it's a 127 page questionnaire if you want to get clearance. Uh, yeah, 
anyway, that's about all you need to know for, for that. Anytime you see the word formal, think documented. Formal means documented. If it's not documented, it doesn't exist. It's not formal. So a formal access approval, uh, documented, approved by the owner. That's a role that we're going to define here in a minute about classifying data. Uh, the owner is the person who's ultimately responsible for that data. There's different types of owners. There's business owners, application owners, data owners. Uh, but they're the ones that are responsible. They're also the ones who know the value of that data. They're also the ones that should be consulted on who should have access to that data. right? So when you do a user account audit or you do a privilege audit of um, a file share, whoever owns that file share, that's who you take the list to and say who, who here should have access and who here shouldn't. Right? That's a data owner. That's their responsibility. Um, they should approve subject access to certain objects, the ones that they specifically own for sure. Uh, they need to understand the rules and requirements. So once we've defined a data classification policy, assuming that data owners know what their role is without training them on what their role is, that's, that's going to fail. Uh, but ideally, every access request, every uh, audit, uh, every Certification and accreditation would be signed off on by a data owner. That's another thing you'll need to know for the exam, and I don't know when we get to it, but the difference between certification and accreditation. So certification is uh, auditing a system or assessing a system against a specific standard or set of requirements. That's certification. Once it's been approved or accepted by the owner, that's accreditation. Okay, so certification and accreditation are two different things. You'll see that on the exam too. But the owner oftentimes does the accreditation, the approval. All right, this is just a data classification policy sample. Everybody here, anybody here, everybody's here seen a data classification policy before? Okay. We essentially just define in the private sector, in most cases, we just define three roles, three classifications. The three roles are owner, custodian, and user. The three classifications are confidential, internal use, and public. If you get any more complicated than that, it's going to be really, really, really difficult to implement. It's already difficult enough, but when you go beyond that, it gets even harder. So three classifications, confidential, internal use, and public. Uh, like I said, easy to document. Now, out of data classification comes all kinds of different things. You've got minimum protection requirements. You've got labeling requirements, data destruction, data storage requirements. So because you'll treat that data, you'll treat confidential data a lot differently than you treat public data, right? I sent numerous public emails today, and I also sent numerous confidential emails today. Confidential emails, we encrypt, right? Public emails, I don't care, right? So, and we, we label our documents. So on the bottom, we have a labeling standard, right? If it's public, it clearly states in the bottom that it's public. If it's confidential, it clearly states on the bottom it's confidential because I might know what the classification is, but does the person who's receiving it know what the classification is? So that's why labeling standards are really important. Right? I also want somebody to hold me accountable. If I send a confidential document through email, not encrypted, I need somebody needs to tell me about that, right? I, I made a mistake. Uh, you know, so we use it for that too. So these are just standard things for a data owner responsible for, dependent upon the data. It's easy like in a uh, like an accounting package. I don't, know, I don't know what we use for accounting here. What's, account, what's an accounting package? Like dynamics, is that? That's an ERP. Yeah, there you go. So it, that one's an easy one, right? Because I know the accounting department owns that application and probably the head of the accounting department, the CFO. Now they might delegate ownership responsibilities to maybe a controller or somebody else uh, but at the end of the day, it's still the owner, right? Because maybe they're too busy, they don't have time. That's okay. What you don't want is your data custodian making access uh, approvals, right? A custodian is like IT, right? They're the ones who maintain the system according to what the data owner wants or what the classification is. Uh, they're the ones that suffer the most when you lose a system if you if you uh, want to know who the data owner is of a specific application, just turn it off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One who screams the loudest, that's your owner. I mean, I don't know. If, I don't know if you guys have that much power in your companies or not, but that's one way to tell. 
And if you turn it off and nobody complains, probably didn't need it. So that's good. One less thing on the asset inventory you got to worry about. Uh, data custodian, typically this is IT. They're taking direction from the data owner and the data classification scheme on how they're protecting the information. In most organizations, data custodians are making access approvals. Yeah, I mean that's that's really common because they haven't gone through we haven't gone through the process yet of defining and holding accountable the people that are really accountable. Right? Yeah. So what do you do on a data owner? Train. Right. Repeat the question. Train. Oh, what do you do when the data owner is clueless? Train. I mean, one of the challenges in information security, it's in my book. Something about my book? I wrote a book. No, like super book. long. Almost died. Uh, but we're not speaking the same language. When we talk to people who are clueless, they don't, it's not that they're clueless. They just don't speak the same language we do. I mean, oftentimes it's what it is. Uh, and so I, I use the analogy of the, you know, well, not analogy, but there's 785,000 security people in this country, people with security jobs, 327 million people in this country. So it's no, it's no surprise. And I call those people the normal people, right? Cause I'm not normal. When I speak the language that I speak, when I talk about information security, if I'm not held in check. If I don't remind myself that the person I'm talking to may not have any clue about what I'm saying. So I remind myself that I'm not normal, that they actually are normal. When I put, when I flip it back like that, it gives me more patience in dealing with people that they may actually be clueless. I don't know, but it helps me go the extra few steps to try to explain, you know, stuff. Because it like, I don't know, anybody here work in accounting? No, because I'm not good with money. So when you talk to me about accounting stuff, I'm like, whatever. I don't, I don't understand. You'd have to speak a different language to me. No, so I don't speak their language either. So I assume that most of the people that are employed in our companies are skilled at what it is that they're doing. Right? I mean, thanks. So we're probably good at whatever language they do speak. We got, maybe I've got a translation problem. Does that help? Just remind yourself that all the time, man. They're not as dumb as they think they as I think they are. <laughs> Maybe they are. Uh, so data custodians and then data users. Really, the simplest way to think of a data user is just they need to use the data according to policy. You know, they just use it in an authorized manner. That's all a data user has to do. Uh, so not circumventing controls. They're not, you know, but they also have a responsibility to know what the policy is. And that's a shared responsibility. I need to communicate what that policy is to them as well. Um, but ignorance is no excuse anymore. It's not defensible. Uh, we're seeing you know, a lot more CEOs and executives being held accountable for things that they weren't being accountable for before. Ignorance, they used to claim, well, we just didn't know. Have you ever heard that before? Well, I don't want to know what I don't know. You know, because if I know, then I got to do something about it. The, the, the issue is you actually still have to do something about it, right? Ignorance isn't defensible. Uh, so data users. Confidential data, just lay, lay out what, a, what confidential data is and what the, uh, you know, give general definitions and policy of what confidential data is. General requirements, high level requirements, things that executive management and non-information security people would understand. Uh, I like need to know. So the difference between it here, so this is a sample of our policy, actually. This is FR Secure's policy. You see FR Secure sample policy everywhere. The difference between confidential data and internal data, the biggest thing is need to know. We all have access to internal data. I have confidential data. So one of my clients is that I work with is Flight Center. Right? All of the documents that I use with Flight Center, only I see. Only I have the need to know. Actually, you do too, because you're you're back up on that. So, but none of the rest, none of the rest of the the people in the organization have a need to know that information. So, that's the difference, right? That's the biggest difference. That's why it's highlighted. The biggest difference between confidential and internal data is the need to know. A lot of other stuff there, uh, and then label out what your minimum protection requirements are for confidential data. So confidential data, if you're sending it anywhere externally, it has to be encrypted. Uh, confidential data, 
can't be left unauthenticated, unattended, it has to be locked up. You know, all those things are important with confidential data. We actually have a couple of pages of a couple of listings of minimum protection requirements for confidential data, which is what you expect. And more. So this is if, if confidential data is ever lost or stolen, it needs to be reported to the to the our information security committee and then that committee will then implement or assess whether or not we need to activate the incident response plan. Right? That only happens with confidential data. It's internal data. There's still a classification, it still might end up at the committee level, but only if it's a lot of it, probably. Right. So but here, any disclosure, one record, one record, we need to know it so that we can account for it. And this ha this does happen. We're humans just like everybody else in our own company. You know, I'd be lying if I said we didn't, haven't accidentally sent a, uh, a report to a client that was somebody else's report. That's, that's a human process. It happens. Uh, but there's a process to handle that, right? That's confidential data. We don't want that to happen. But, and I, I actually find out about that stuff when that happens. Um, it's, a big, it's a big deal. Uh, minimum labeling requirements. So there's confidential, right? It's italicized, it's bold, and it's red. That has to be in the header, or I think here it says just the footer. It has to be in the footer of the document so that everybody who gets this document knows it's confidential data. Internal data. A little less, but you know, just expl explanations of what internal data is. Internal data can be freely distributed internally. One of the most common like internal data things is like a phone directory, an internal phone directory. If it gets disclosed, it's not going to be a huge deal. Nobody's going to, you know, suffer a lot of harm from that. But it's also not something we want to publish on our website and have available to everybody. Uh, that's a good example of of internal data, planning, planning documents, org, org charts, stuff like that. Minimum protection requirements for internal data, list them in your policy, and then uh, you can see it's a, it's a distinctly different labeling requirement. Uh, it's still bold, it's still italic, but it's in blue. So, you know, people don't read stuff. You guys know that? Write policies and you're like, it's funny how many people like have work in organizations that say, you know, when you start that I have read and accept the policies of the organization. So you got all these people lying in companies because nobody read them, right? I don't even know if I read them. Or if you stop and try to read them, HR gets really ticked because you're holding up the rest right. of the employee the orientation. Let's go. Let's go. What are you? Are you actually reading it? Crazy. So we don't expect people to read policies. The thing that makes a policy a good policy is it's a reference document. It's not a book. It's not something I ever expect anybody to read. It's something I expect people to reference regularly. That's what makes a good policy from a, a bad policy. And stop wasting people time, people's time having people read like mobile device policy if I'm a user who never uses mobile devices. right? Only give me the policies that are actually applicable to my job uh, data classification is one of those policies that really does apply to everybody. It's one of what we call a cornerstone information security policy. It holds. If you think of putting together a security program, like putting together a jigsaw puzzle, you have those corner pieces. Data classification is a corner piece. Right? All of your policies would kind of form the rules for the game. Like, um, you, you imagine, so like uh, you have people over, uh, for a dinner party or whatever, and you get this new game at Target, right? And in that game are the instructions for the game. That's your policies, right? There's only one person who reads those, right? You don't have you don't pass the instructions around to everybody, do you? Do you really? Do you do it that way? We usually have arguments over. Oh. And their interpretations. Because usually you have one person who reads the rules, and that would be, you know, typically me, you know, as the CISO, I would read the rules, I would understand the rules, I'd be able to enforce the rules, I'd be able to teach others the rules. And so in that board game, I'm, I'm explaining to them how to play the game. And then as they're playing the game, they make mistakes, and I explain to them that's, you know, either that's a rule violation, or this is what it means, you know, and those. 
But again, it's just me who's reading the rules, and I regularly go back and reference the rules. Policies are supposed to work a lot the same way, right? They're not meant for everybody to read. I don't know why we why we ever thought that was a good idea. Uh, but in, anyway, I got off on a tangent. Internal data. I do that from time to time, don't I? Public data, or is it public? Public data? That could be from the Eastern Bloc. Maybe that's how I call it. Go back. Um, so we have a lot of auditors that want to see the sign off that all the employees have read the policy. Yep. Instead, have them sign off that they understand what the policies are, that that they that the policies have been introduced to them. Just use different words. Mm -hmm. I don't like. I'm a literal person, and I don't like having people sign something that says that they read the policies when they never read the policies. Okay. So I've received and understand that I have to apply. With policies and know where they're located. Yeah. Yeah. So I would just change the wording. Your auditors won't even notice. And if you explain it to them that way, I think they'd get it. I mean, do you really want all my users to lie? You want to start our relationship off like that? <laughs> uh, so public data, public data is now the only, so when you look at confidentiality, integrity, and availability, I don't care much about confidentiality of public data. I care a lot more about integrity, right? Anything I'm releasing to the public should be accurate. And I also care uh, about availability, right? So there's still some protection requirements. It's just not the confidentiality ones that we're always so focused on in information security. Anything that you release to the public should be approved by somebody within the organization that this is, you know, okay for public viewing. But there's really no disclosure requirements. Anybody can view public data. Uh, minimum protection requirements for public data, there are none. Specifically, you know, protection requirements for, for the public data itself, right? Once it's been classified as public data, we don't do much to protect it. Um, internal data, uh, oh, it, that's not right. Minimum, minimum labeling requirements for public data, that should say, not internal data. Uh, but we just put public in the footer. If it's not, labeled at all, the default classification for data here is internal. So if there's no classification whatsoever, so I have no authority to release it outside of the organization. I can share it freely within the organization if it's not classified at all. That's the way we handle it. Any questions on that? Yeah. How do you handle organizations to say all of their information is classified and everybody has to be able to see it. So like Locker. All their information is what? All of their information is confidential or classified. Whatever they and they say. should take down the website, they should take down all their marketing materials, they should yeah. get rid of all their business cards, they should get rid of all their email addresses. But if they say it's all confidential and everybody in the locker, for example, has to have access to all of it. It's a coaching thing. I mean that's that's there's no structure to that information security program. And it's common to run into that. Right? But, but an attorney who's working in governmental affairs, having access to, you know, a libel lawsuit, you know, the sharing of that data, the ultimate owner of that data would be their clients, right? And so if they can go to their clients and say, this is how we handle data and the clients are fine with that, then who would I be to argue that? But I don't think that they could do that. And so usually it's taking them through. You do that a lot with, uh, there was this large healthcare organization that their FISA score uh, two, three years ago was a 450 something, right? And uh, and they contracted for us to do FISA scores on a regular basis. So the next year we came up and it was a 470. And they were just, all right, well, let's, let's schedule our next one next year. And I was like, oh, hold up. That's not cool. I mean, you're forced, it's in the very poor range, that's the red range, right? Because what they, and so I just, I asked for a, a meeting with uh, executive management. So, you know, any of the C-level people that would listen, we had the CTO, CIO, CFO, and a couple others. And I just explained to them that th this data that you protect belongs to the people that are in your facilities. And if, and I, if you can take a 470, or 479 to them, and they say, yeah, that's cool with us, then I, I won't have any problem with that. But I don't think you can do that. Can you take this data and say, 
hey, we're protecting it very poorly. Are you okay? Because the thing is, is bad things happen. No matter what you do, you cannot eliminate risk. This isn't a risk elimination game. This is a risk management game, right? And so knowing that no matter what I do, I cannot prevent breaches from happening. A breach will happen, right? The magnitude, the impact, and how often that, you know, we can speculate all day on that. But I know from enough breach responses that when a breach happens, you immediately go into this defensibility mode. You start gathering all this information about what do I have to defend myself against lawsuits, against the attorney general, against the OCR, against whoever else is coming. And what you have right now is a 479. That's going to be discoverable, you know, in the event of a breach. And you're going to have to respond to that. The same thing would happen to, uh, to lawyers. Now, lawyers, uh, three, four, five years ago, they felt as though they could litigate themselves out of all breaches, which was sort of true, but they couldn't protect themselves against reputational impact. And in law firms, reputation is like golden. So it was only like three, four years ago in the ABA, the Bar Association came out with some guidance too about that same time. That's when lawyers really started to shift and, and a lot of security consulting work with law firms. So I think with just law, this law firm is just an explanation of how this really works because the default answer, the lazy answer is it's all confidential. That's lazy. It's not an answer. Is that too harsh? You guys smell what I'm stepping in? All right, so ownership, defining owners, business owners, data owners, system owners, now in a smaller organization, this is a lot easier, but in a large organization with tens of thousands of users, you might have IT, you know, three different IT groups supporting one system, right? So you've got different types of IT owners. You might have an IT system owner, an IT application owner. You might have an IT database owner, and then you've got system owners, you know? So defining all these owners, the larger the organizations, the, uh, the more difficult it gets, but doesn't mean you don't do it. Somebody has to be responsible for this stuff. I don't know how we understand, I don't know how we can implement security controls without defining who does what here, right? And so it's not fun, I mean, sort of, but it's, it's foundational, it's fundamental. So defining business owners, data owners, system owners, uh, documenting what these owners are responsible for, and my, my, usually my take on these things is if, if I'm expecting anybody other than just me to do something, I should document it so that we're doing it the same way together, right? So owner responsibilities, there's multiple owners. What are their responsibilities? Yeah. You should document it even if it's just you. Well, yeah, probably. But I'm talking like just in my normal day-to-day -day work. No, every, every normal day-to-day -day thing you do, you should have documentation for it. But I don't want to. <laughs> what, what happens if you're not here tomorrow? You're just not here tomorrow? I, just, I make it up. It's kind of no, your I mean, look, like, <laughs> you get hit by a bus or win the lottery. You know? Win the lottery. Let's be positive. Okay. <laughs> I'll lose the other kidney. Sure. <laughs> How is somebody going to take over? No, you're right. Your document as much as possible. Wait, you won't be able to document everything. No. No matter what, no matter what you do. Sure. You do. Anything sure. that's a document, anything that is a repeatable process is documentable. Yep, and I like to delegate. I do. I mean, I like to trust because I, I'm a big believer that the more I delegate, the more I elevate, right? So the more I trust others to do things. So a lot of the stuff that for me today that's really critical for the organization has already been delegated. We have a president of FR Secure. We have a CFO. We have a COO. So I like that, but you're right. I mean, the things that I do do, I said doo doo. I what need to document. Do do yep, my doo 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 doo. You should quit delegate that documentation. <laughs> I have an assistant. Question for you. Are they going to need to know the different types of owners within the for the exam or just that there's an ownership and what the owner's responsibility would be? Uh, I wouldn't spend a ton of time yeah. preparing on the exam, separating these out, but just understand it. Yeah, understand for sure what ownership means in information security. Uh, and then segregation of duties is one of those things too that's very difficult. 
uh, to assess and implement other outside of like the obvious, right? Financial systems. This is pretty easy for segregation of duties. You don't want the same person uh, you know, authorizing you know, POs and payments and cutting checks and signing checks and you know that's a, a big no-no. Uh, but in other parts of information security, it's sometimes difficult. Uh, but when we define ownership, custodian, and user, we've now segmented because it's not the owner who actually grants the permissions to the systems. It's the custodian who does that. It's the system owner who approves those permissions, right? So you start to separate out, and segregation of duties is, is kind of a big deal. Data controllers and data processors. Anybody here GDPR? Do any GDPR stuff? Yeah. I was going to say poor you, but that's actually, you like that. And it is actually a good thing for us. <clears throat> the GDPR is a, uh, do you know what it applies to? EU, EU uh, residents or citizens? I don't know. It hasn't been enforced yet. <laughs> but I'd say the most conservative and the most common opinion is that it's residents. So you don't have to be an EU citizen. Uh, but I think the loosest definition is sit both. Right? So if you're a citizen who's living here in the United States, GDPR still applies. We have a small town bank of like four employees that has one person who lives in the EU. And so true, I mean, GDPR does apply to them. You know, small community bank, four employees, um, whatever. So GDPR is... Uh, but in GDPR, they have this concept. It's, it's explicit in GDPR uh, between data controllers and data processors. Processors work on behalf of the controllers. The controllers are typically the ones that are collecting that data. They're the ones who are ultimately responsible for the protection of that data. Uh, but they sub some of that stuff out to maybe data processors. Uh, GDPR becomes a, uh, effective. This won't be in the exam, but it becomes effective next month, May 25th. Yep. Is it not in the exam? Did they that? Uh, it's not in any of the materials I've seen. And it seems like it's probably too current to be in the exam. But if it is, that's, I mean, I, I can't imagine you need to know much more that, about that than, you know, there are individual rights that have to be. Um, if you're interested in GDPR, we do have a cheat sheet that I can send out to everybody about what GDPR is. I'm working for that same global company that I was telling you about earlier. They've got, we've got the Americas. EMEA, that's Europe, and then APAC, and they're trying to, it's a big travel company, right? Think of all the personally identifiable information that they have of European citizens, and they're trying to wade through all this GDPR stuff. Thank God I'm not the data protection officer. You have to have a DPO. That's a role that has to be defined and implemented for GDPR compliance. I'm their VCSO, their virtual chief information security officer, so I'm staying right in my lane. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to do any GDPR work right now. I got plenty of work to do just right in this lane. Uh, but really, when you think about it, privacy is just a subset of information security, isn't it? It's confidentiality of one type of data, right? So I think where organizations really struggle with privacy and security is when they separate them out. And HIPAA got us off on the wrong foot with this, with the privacy rule and the, the, the security rule. Now you got the breach notification rule. Because lawyers rushed in to do the privacy stuff and so you had to fill out all those documents and sign off everything but security was kind of that afterthought and i think if you would have done this in hindsight you got it better you'd have built security programs and you would have put privacy inside of it right same with compliance okay anyway i'm on another tangent but if you uh gdpr is a big deal a big deal two to two or five percent of your annual revenue is the cap for fines uh, for GDPR, so big fines. Facebook, Google, they're not even close. Well, Google might be. You remember Google came out like a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago, with uh, a tool that you go and download every single bit of information that Google has about you? That was driven from GDPR. That was part of their GDPR compliance because that's one of the rights, one of the individual rights coming from GDPR. Facebook, I think, they just implement something similar to that. I suppose you could go just go to that Analytica place. <laughs> Probably get it all there if you want. 
Uh, so memory and remnants. We're going to go deeper into memory, but at this point, this is about all you need to know. So when uh, remnants is just data that's left over. That's what remnants means. It's, you know, data that sometimes I delete the data and there's still data there, uh, or I remove power from memory um, from you know static or dynamic RAM, and uh, there's still some data remaining. That actually happens for a little while before those capacitors kind of refresh or die out. Uh, the thing to remember about memory is the closest to the CPU, the more expensive the memory, the faster the memory. More expensive mean, meaning uh, there's less of it, there's more contention for it, uh, because it, you know, and it is faster. So level one cache is actually on the CPU itself. The register file is actually another chip uh, on the CPU. Uh, and it is, I guess, you know, memory. But the level one cache is on the CPU. Level two cache is one step removed, a little less expensive, a little more available, uh, but also very fast. The slowest memory, uh, well, the slowest, slowest memory is actually memory uh, swap files that are typically stored on uh, magnetic media or SSDs. Um, but SRAM, static, static random access memory, is uh, the least expensive of what you see here. Does that make sense? Any questions on on memory? We'll get more into system architecture a little bit later. Anybody here A plus certified? Is that what they call it now? Mm -hmm. They always called it? Okay. I was never much of a hardware guy. Uh, so not my strongest suit. Uh, different types of memory, random access memory, volatile, meaning that you, you remove, it, it's constantly being refreshed. It needs to be constantly refreshed. You remove power, it's, it's gone. Uh, modules and slots that you typically see in old PCs. Now everybody seems like they're using, uh, in closed case, uh, uh, whatever these laptops, uh, so you don't actually see the memory modules anymore. DRAM, uh, same sort of thing, capacitors. The difference between DRAM and static RAM is one's capacitors, the other is flip-flops, just storage spaces within the memory itself. Uh, yeah, so you just need to memorize that. No refreshing on static RAM. Uh, dynamic memory, dynamic RAM requires constant refresh, right? Constant pulses of electricity to continue the refresh to keep the memory active. Uh, static RAM doesn't have that. That's kind of the biggest differences. ROM read-only memory and flash memory. Read-only memory is written to once, you know, Pure read-only memory is burned in at the factory, and it's never rewritten. Um, but there's different types of ROM memory. You've got EEPROM, EEPROM, right there, and PLDs. Yeah, PLDs are just pro programmable logic devices, uh, field programmable, so you can rewrite those in the field. Different types of memory can be PLDs. EEPROMs, EEPROMs are all PLDs. Uh, so read-only so read memory proms are burned in at the factory. There's no, there's no refresh. There's no flash. There's an EEPROM and EEPROM. EEPROMs can be flashed, but they're flashed usually with ultraviolet light. Whereas EEPROMs, the first E in EEPROM is electrical. They're refreshed electrically, right? They're flashed electric, electrically. They're non-volatile, so you remove power and they're still there. So the data is still there. Flash memory is a pain in the butt. From a security perspective, uh, it wasn't, it's not a big deal anymore. It seems like people aren't complaining about flash drives as much as they used to. Uh, I wonder why. It's probably more convenient just to use Dropbox or something else, or Whole different set of challenges. email it to you know your Gmail account or something. It's all kinds of online storage now that makes it easier than using flash memory. Uh, but flash memory is just it's another type of EE prompt, right? You can you refresh it or you can overwrite it electrically. It's non-volatile. Uh, you can store gigabytes, terabytes now on uh, flash drives. It's a lot of data that you can take wherever you want. Any questions on this stuff? Okay. All right, data, data destruction. So the best data destruction practice, so if you ever see competing data destruction stuff, on the test, the best is physical destruction. Physically destroy the drive. 
Um, in practice, really on magnetic media, like a, like a hard drive, all you really need to do is hit the spindle with a hammer that warps the platters, right? Those are the things that spin around. You ever seen a hard drive before? It spins around, you've got a head that goes and seeks and finds the data. If you warp the platters, that makes the data unreadable, uh, enough so that you would actually have to send it to a data recovery service like um, Kroll to get the data off. So you don't have to go crazy with it. It's more fun to shoot it. Any shooters in here? Yeah, it's more fun to shoot hard drives, and make pretty good targets because they got a little hole in the middle or a little, you know, part in the middle. That's where the spindle is that you can aim for. It's a really cool sculptures for that. Yep. But the best way to do data destruction is fully auditable. There have been cases before uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee, I think was the last one I remember, that lost, you know, a number of hard drives. Uh, and they weren't really sure what happened to them. I don't know if they were stolen, I don't know if they were lost, but they ended up being discovered. And Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee, and I'm going from memory, so I'm not sure if I'm 100% correct, uh, asserted that these drives had all been destroyed, but they couldn't prove it, right? And so, uh, because there wasn't an audit trail, you know, for hard drives. So what we really like to see for data destruction practices is that it is auditable, that serial numbers are, are written down uh, in the date of destruction and a certificate of destruction. Um, there's organizations NAID certified, N-A-I-D, N-A-I-D, National Association of Something Destruction, I don't know what the I is, IT Destruction, Information Technology, whatever. There's NAID certified data destruction companies. You know, those are ones that understand data destruction practices. We like data destruction to be done on site versus shipping the drives somewhere or taking the drives somewhere and having them destroyed somewhere else uh, because there's a chain of custody issue potentially between the time you took it from the dock to the time you actually destroyed it, uh, all those things. So we don't like deleting files. Deleting files does nothing for data destruction. Uh, it just deletes an entry in the file allocation table, which is what your operating system uses to show you what you have on the drive. Um, lots and lots of data free forensic tools, data recovery tools, uh, you know, to get that data back. Anybody ever had to do that before? Yeah, I've had, I mean, we've all had family members at one point or another deleted family pictures off their computer or something. Oh, my God. You come over and you look like, you get like a free apple pie and you find the data, the free tool. Same thing applies to the little cards, right? Same thing. That's a clean room. That's oftentimes what you need to get uh, data that's been destroyed. So shredding uh, with magnetic media, shredding would be overriding the drive, right? Uh, every sector of a drive would be shredding data. There's also the physical shredding of papers, right? So sometimes you'll see shredding used interchangeably in both of those scenarios. There's a link to some forensic tools if you want. If you're into data recovery and uh, you know you're geeky like that, you can go play around with some tools. There's hundreds, hundreds of them. Uh, bless you. Now, truly, there's, you know, I remember back there was such a debate on, you know, should I do a 26 pass overwrite of my drive? It's like, no, you shouldn't do a 26 write over whatever the hell. Uh, truly, all you really need is just one pass of every sector of a drive makes that drive unreadable without having to go and pay thousands of thousands of dollars at Kroll. You, you really don't have to. Three pass is pretty good. Uh, there's a built-in tool. I think it's in Windows 10 still, mm -hmm. Cypher, yeah. that you can use to overwrite drives, uh, just built into, built into Windows. You can use one of these tools if you want. DBAN is a very, really popular tool. Derek's boot and nuke is what DBAN stands for. Uh, but <clears throat> there was a bunch of different methodologies that came out. DOD methodologies, the Gutman Pass, Schneier, Bruce Schneier had his own. So a bunch of the different ones. You don't have to go crazy with it. So I don't know if you've ever sat there and waited for a 26 pass overwrite. Anybody ever done that? It's like days. It's not going to happen like overnight. Even a three pass overwrite, which is what comes with Cypher, I think default built into Windows, it's a command built into Windows, uh, is still a day, probably. So overwriting it just once is probably fine. Um, 
We like to see overwrites before they go to a storage area for destruction, right? So just sending a drive to, you know, a storage area and it, assuming that it's secure there and then sending it to destruction, um, there's still a, a gap, right? There's, you can steal that drive or lose that drive between the time it gets out of the computer to the time it's destroyed. And that does happen. People do steal hard drives. Why would you, why would you take the time to wipe the drives when you can just drill a hole? Yeah, you, yeah, like you can do that. What I, what I mean is you're going to wipe the drive before it's sent to destruction. Yeah. It's much faster. Just spray yourself. Yeah, but, uh, uh, yeah, you can do that. Is there a scenario where it makes sense to do that at, at scale? We're, our company is trying to do that at scale. So if we're going to have a bunch of them, bringing them back to a central spot before we do that, just sit around and get actually to destroy all of them. I just, like, I, that's where I learned the trick of just hitting the spindle, mm -hmm. just warping the platters. Okay. I never, I never really over wrote stuff other than just playing around. The buyer would just hit spindles, warp the platter, and then put it into storage. Or did Gaussers work nice too for magnetic media? It Because it truly destroys the integrity of the entire drive. You'll never be able to use that drive again. And so a degausser is just basically a big magnet, and you just put it on there and throw it in the bin. So a lot better ways to do it. You should also wipe the drive before reusing it too, right? Yes. There, these do have even if you do physically destroy it for you know before you send it off for shredding, you do have a point for. Yeah, yeah. There's it. still data remnants even on reimaged machines, depending on how you laid down the image, you know the new image. Uh, what else was there about? Data destruction. Oh, that's why another big reason why we like encryption. Right? If a drive is fully encrypted with pre-boot, we call it pre-boot authentication, uh, I can make a case for not. I mean, I don't really care if somebody steals the, the drive as long as I can prove that it was encrypted. Right? And there's a lot of uh, safe harbors, you know, for a lot of compliance requirements. But who was one? There was one safe harbor that they were removing. It was some state. It might have been Tennessee, actually, Tennessee. who removed their safe harbor for encryption. So it was like, man, I don't know if that's going to have the right consequence. I mean, I don't know if that's going to have the intended consequences, right? Because the fact that the safe harbor was there was a big move to me encrypting data. Now, if you remove that safe harbor, I may not make a case for encrypting data you know, on hard drives. But anyway, if you've encrypted it, Correctly, it mitigates the risk of you know your data destruction practices. I'm sorry. As long as you delete the key. Delete the key. Yep. Or you know, if you're the user, only you have the key. Potentially, and I suppose I have a support key. So overriding, if you're ever interested, it is. I don't know. I guess it's sort of fun watching the dots go. If you're into that <laughs> stuff, most of us are probably done with that now. But uh, this will be in the test. One way, uh, you know, it's overriding. You know, overriding will be on the test. And I, I doubt you'll see DBAM specifically, but it's a common tool. And then the cipher command in Windows, and there's the command line for that. Degaussing, there's a degaussing machine. You just place the drive on it, throw it in the bin. I mean, it's that easy. A big magnet. It destroys the integrity of the drive. The thing, to remember about degaussing is you're not going to reuse that drive. You can't lay a new image on a degaussed magnetic drive. The integrity is shot. Uh, destruction, you like physical destruction. Shredders are cool. Anybody ever seen a hard drive shredder? Mm -hmm. Those things are badass. I remember the first time I saw one, I was like, oh, I need one of these. My wife wouldn't let me get one. But uh, yeah. Hard drive shredding, we like on site, we like recorded shredding, you know, those are all kind of good things. Whatever we have to improve accountability for the shredding that takes place, but physical destruction is good. Uh, National Association of Information Destruction, that's the NAID certified. You know, if you're looking for something, all your data destruction companies, even the ones that aren't NAID certified necessarily, can destroy a drive just fine. I like to use NAID certified because when I'm being audited from a customer or somebody else, it's one less thing I have to defend, right? Remember I told you that breaches happen. What do I have to defend myself? This is one less thing I have to worry about in terms of defending myself. 
right? That's why I like objective versus subjective. Every time I can take out the ability or the, my reasoning, I can go with objective criteria like that risk acceptance criteria. Uh, it's defensible. Shredding, paper shredder. Most people think of paper, strip cut, cross cut. So strip cut is just cutting lines. Cross cut is like this. We like cross cut. Strip cut is easy to put back together again. Even cross cut, if you have enough time and you got all the data, you know, all the material, you can put cross cut together again too. Uh, easy to audit. So we like, like you, most people have their data or their paper destruction and their paper recycling right next to each other. Do you guys have that in your companies? They're very closely. You ever looked in the recycling one to see how much confidential information is in there? That's an easy audit to perform. Right you'll find it's right next to the printer. Right. Yeah. So you'll find a lot of it in there. And that would be maybe a, a mitigating control. Maybe we move that, you know, further away. I'd rather people because paper destruction is so cheap now. I mean, maybe even just get rid of recycling, because that's what they do with it anyway. Right? After they destroy that paper, they recycle it. So dumpster diving. Anybody ever dumpster dived before? One man's trash, another man's treasure. No? I know you have. I have. I've been busted numerous times doing this. I actually have a story behind dumpster diving and the police came. And then I actually, the police ended up helping me in my attack. For, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, hello. Social engineering attacks. Dumpster diving is nice because you can find a lot of good information to build a pretext. So a pretext is your story that you're going to use. It's basically who you're going to act like when you do your social engineering attack, and you find a lot of good stuff in, in the dumpster for that stuff. You can also I found Rapala. Like one time I was in, a, I found myself in a dumpster just somehow. <laughs> At a, and they made Rapala lures, and they had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Rapala lures. And you look at them and it's like, what's the defect in this thing? So I actually went in and asked, can I take some of these? I'm like, oh yeah, go ahead, take some. So I came home like, like 150, 200 Rapala lures. I was handing them out to my friends. Yeah, stuff you can find in dumpsters. Uh, so certification accreditation, I think, I already mentioned this before, but the difference between certification and accreditation, certification is the actual testing or assessment of the system according to a standard or requirements. Accreditation is the approval of those findings or that certification. So certification validation, accreditation is the acceptance. Keep those two um, clear in your mind. All right, and some security standards and control frameworks that we run into all the time. PCI DSS, data security standard maintained by the PCI Council. Uh, there are QSAs, FR Secure is a QSA, a Qualified Security Assessor. You mentioned an SAQ, that's a self-assessment questionnaire. There's ROCs, Report on Compliance. There's all kinds of things around PCI compliance. PCI compliance only applies to payment cards, right? Credit cards and debit cards, they apply to both. Uh, the current version, did you have a question? No. Okay. Uh, is, <clears throat> I think the current version is 3.2. I'm not a PCI QSA uh, person. Um, it's funny though, after the target breach, you guys remember the target breach, 2013? One of the things I got to do, which is one of the highlights of my career, uh, was I was a, a consultant to the Special Litigation Committee. So in that target breach, there's a derivative lawsuit that was filed. That's where the shareholders filed suit against the board of directors. And then what happens is the court appoints a special litigation committee to investigate the charges to see if the case should proceed. The cool thing about this is I learned everything about everything about PCI compliance because I was able to see all of the working papers. I was able to see their report on compliance, everything that justified everything. You know, remember when I talked about the cardholder data environment? The cardholder data environment is the gold in a PCI environment. And I was able to under, you know, understand the difference between segmentation and isolation. So isolation is not having port 3389 open between the corporate network and the cardholder data environment, right? 3389 is RDP. That's not isolation. 
that might be segmentation. VLANs, it'd be segmentation. Isolation is when I put a packet filtering device between the two, right? That's what PCI. If I want to segment out my cardholder data environment, I need to have isolation between the environments. The DSS applies to the cardholder data environment. Uh, maintained by the, the Standards Council. Uh, Visa MasterCard Discover. One of the things you'll find about PCI, I don't know if there's any PCI people in here. Am I in trouble if I say stuff? I mean, the council find out or something and take away our QSA. They're going to yell at me. But I think it's a racket. PCI compliance, because every breach that you've ever seen with payment cards, you'll always find that they were not PCI compliant. Even though the QSA signed the rock that said that they were, they attested to PCI compliance. Because it's all, it's all in the interpretation of the rules, right? So the council still attests to the fact that if you were fully PCI compliant, that you could not suffer a breach, right? And so that's how they get away from liability. So you can't sue the council because there was a credit card breach. And you really, you very, you'll be very unsuccessful in suing the QSA, right? The one who signed and wrote the report on compliance because, it'll, again, it'll come down to the interpretation. It always falls back onto the retailer or the merchant. Uh, so anyway, it's all kind of a, a funny game that we play with PCI compliance. It's really, the reason why the, why the card companies got together was they wanted to keep um, confidence in the stability of the payment card system. Because if you lose confidence... In, in, the, in the payment card system, they'll stop using Visa. They'll stop using MasterCard, right? And then they'll lose money, and then they'll be all unhappy. So it's more about restoring confidence in the payment card system than it is in actual security, right? And they beat the government to it. If they wouldn't have gotten to this, the government would have certainly. And after all the breaches, they've had to been call, they've been called up to Capitol Hill, and the government's inquired. And every time you're like, oh, is the government going to do something about it this time or not? Anyway, use Apple Pay. <laughs> or PCI should be pay, uh, pay cash instead. That's what PCI should stand for. So anyway, cardholder data environment, that is the scope. Uh, if you haven't adequately segmented or, or isolated your network, everything's in scope. Right? So if everything's in scope for PCI compliance and you're like an SAQD kind of person, a company, good luck. It's not going to, it's, it's really not going to happen, I don't think, easily. Uh, so that's usually where we start, is determining what the scope is, narrowing the scope as much as possible. Ideally, we can take PCI requirements completely out of the picture. Right? If we can do end-to-end -end encryption, so from the, 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 the point where you put your card in, it's encrypted there and encrypted all the way to the processor, even though it transverses your network, you could potentially eliminate PCI compliance from your environment. That's the best case. Octave. Octave is another. It's a it's a risk assessment methodology. It's it's I think it's still open source, uh, but that's what it stands for. It's very well known. It was developed by Carnegie Mellon uh, University. If you want the link, three phases uh, to the risk assessment approach: staff acknowledge assets and threats, identify vulnerabilities, and then do your risk analysis. So, pretty straightforward. Three phases: uh, understand what Octave is, who made Octave, and the three steps, and you should be fine. Uh, ISO 17799 and 2700 series, a lot of history here. Started out as BS 7799, stands for British Standard, not bullshit. It's a different standard altogether. Uh, one of my favorite standards because it's flexible. It's not super prescriptive. It's a great framework to operate within. ISO 27001 is the ISMS standard. That's what really defines the certification of the system. ISO 27002, if you were going to, these are not free, so you have to buy these. Uh, ISO 27002 is the management standard. That's the one that has, you know, many of the actual controls in it uh, that makes it, uh, it's a good standard. But this is a standard that you'll run into over and over and over again uh, uh, in your career, right? And there's a bunch of different ISO standards. It's a series. It's the 27000 series. 27005, I think, is risk management eight. I don't know. I can't remember, but you guys have to remember because you guys have to memorize it. Not me. I already memorized it once. Yep. There's a, what they, 
27002 looks like. Uh, again, it's not freely distributable, so I can't, you won't find a free copy. Well, you can, but you shouldn't, because that'd be unethical. And remember last, last, the last class we didn't talk about ethics? Yeah, so you can't, be, you can't be stealing stuff. Uh, but it's, I don't know, I can't remember how much, it's, it's, they, they, it's in Swiss francs, ISO. International Standards Organization, International Electrical Commission, or whatever, ISO, IEC. Um, but anyway, copyrighted, licensed standard, you can go there if you want to buy a copy. Um, depending on where you're at and what you do with information security, it's a good, co it, it, it's actually a good standard to maybe splurge and buy, depending on whether you can get your company to, to buy it. It's a good standard. I like this standard. It's one of my favorites. It's actually where we started uh, FISA. FISA was originally built on ISO 27002, 2005. Then it became 2013. So there was a, a new release of the ISO standard in 2013. And now it's NIST CSF. NIST CSF is a cybersecurity framework. In the cybersecurity framework, COBIT, I don't really like COBIT, but COBIT is an IT, more IT heavy, right? It's another standard. It's from the uh, International Systems Audit and Control Association, so ISACA, is who maintains COBIT. I think the latest version of COBIT is five. Uh, four domains within COBIT. COBIT's not one of my favorites because it's very IT heavy, right? Uh, I, I like to show we, we the IT part, the technical part of security is really, really easy, honestly, because computers only do what you tell them to do, right? The thing is the people using the computers don't know what they're telling it to do. So the technology piece has never been all that much of a challenge to me. It's when you implement people. Technology is also digital, right? Zeros and ones, very discreet. It's either on or it's off. It's either yes or it's no. I like that. There's no gray area. When you put people, people are analog. You never know where the hell they're at on this wavelength, and they're not discrete. We're motivated by emotions and all this other stuff. So that's why I'm not big on overemphasizing IT and information security, because I believe that people are the most significant risk, right? ITIL. ITIL is another framework. Uh, there is some security blended into ITIL. There's the five service management practices. Getting ITIL certified is not all that difficult. And I know a lot of people, you know, get ITIL certified. I'm, you know, not one of those people. But there's the IT service management. It's very good. At, again, very IT heavy. You're very uh, process heavy. Um, change management, change control, incident management, IT related uh, is, you know, very big on an ITIL. Any ITIL people? Jeez. Okay, excuse me. Love ITL. Yeah. ITL. Did I say I didn't like it? I no, I didn't. I said I didn't like COVID. Yeah. But I am I, I am, yeah. But I'm a member of ISACA too, so I'm like whatever. So NIST CSF. This is this is one this is a nice framework. And the reason why I like this framework is because it incorporates a bunch of different standards. Right? NIST SF incorporates NIST SP 53 It incorporates ISO two seven zero zero one. It incorporates COBIT and incorporates the CIS controls. You know what the CIS controls are? Center for Internet Security has a set of uh, critical security controls. It also incorporates that. So it's a very flexible framework that you can operate within. That's one big benefit of NIST CSF. Another big benefit is it, of the community involvement that came together to create the NIST CSF. It's got a lot of traction, a lot of powerful people in information security and IT came together under the banner of NIST to create the cybersecurity framework. It's also the only framework that is a direct result of a presidential directive. So this came as a presidential directive to go out and create this framework for critical infrastructure. Um, Obama. So yeah, there's the executive order, one three, whatever whatever number it is. Uh, but it's it's a great, I mean, it's it's very flexible. So don't blame the framework for a poor implementation. Blame the implementer for the poor implementation, because it's so flexible. It's almost not. I mean, it's almost like too flexible that you can really screw it up easily. But it's a good it's a good framework. 
lot of people are using it. There's NASTSP Special Publication 800-53. This is the one that's really going to be driven from FISMA compliance, the Federal Information Security Management Act. So if you do business for the federal government, this is one standard that will be often referenced for you. Uh, FIPS 199, FIPS 200, uh, and NIST SB 800-60. So FIPS 199 and 200 are about classifying systems. So depending upon what type of information your system handles, operates with, will determine which controls apply out of the NIST SB 800-53. So FIPS is a Federal Information Processing Standard that drives the controls. All right, so data at rest, protecting data at rest and data in. <clears throat> so the, the best places to start with encryption are the places where I can't assure physical security of the media, right? So that's why we like laptops encrypted, we like flash drives encrypted, we like mobile devices encrypted because it's hard to secure those things physically, right? That's also why we focus so much on sending data outside, when we transfer data outside of the organization, we can't assure the physical security of those transmission media, right? Internal to the organization, somebody would have to tap in physically, right, to get that data most often. So if I have good physical security internally, I might be able to make a case for not encrypting data in transit inside my organization. Does that make sense? So where there's a lack of physical security, that's where I focus on encryption. Okay, so data in transit, physical security, you know, because most people don't think all the places, you guys are all, right? how many people are in IT here? The technical people, yeah. So you know that when I send data from here to there, it goes through a lot of hops, right? A lot of different routers, a lot of different cables, and I don't control any of those, right? So to protect myself from interception of that data, you really have to encrypt it. Whereas internal, I would notice somebody, hopefully, Monkey around in, in, this, in this switch closet or you know a data center. Yeah. Question. Um, I was recently working with a customer, a security guy, having a security audit. He's got a bunch of hacks and kind of things, including getting a key. Nice. I'm right here, Joe. So, <laughs> what do you guys? Oh. Okay. Um, yeah. We were um, we were swapping emails encrypted, and then he said. Oh, I see that we have a TLS connection between our servers. You don't need to encrypt them. And I explained, well, I thought it was all the hop. A TLS connection would be uh, a virtual circuit, and it would be encrypted through all the hops. It so, is encrypted? Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, I know what it is, but the fact that you have the email server, the yep. tunnel between direct and Yep. Yep. It would be using public key, public key cryptography, so asymmetric. It is. Yep. Yep. So TLS... You know, so you can set that up between exchange servers or, you know, really to any servers as long as you got it enabled. So that would be, yeah, when you make it a point chat, when it gets to that server, and it's just sitting there on encrypted. Sure. I don't know if you're going on there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Another question on that is uh, for data in transit, if third party vendors are telling them the data is encrypted, is there a way to tell if the data is really encrypted? We just have to take their look for it. So they've got a connection. They're sending it to to a vendor, a third party. It says, "Yep, we're encrypting it." There are ways to tell that. Well, I guess it depends on where they're encrypting it. We, you know, would dictate what type of proof I'd ask for. I mean, if it's data in transit, I mean, you could sniff the wire, see if you can read the data. I mean, that would prove that it's being encrypted. Right to audit. I like right to audit. Yep. Oh, that should be in every vendor contract you have with anybody that you ever share information with is the right to audit. Yep. We want to be able to audit, and ideally, whenever. Right? We're going to start an audit next week. Oh, really? Why? Because we want to. 
because we don't trust you. You and your encryption. <clears throat> right. Any questions? We got 15 minutes to get through a lot still. <laughs> right? This is fun. Most of you I've seen stay awake. Some of you have seen this. Right, but we got Thursday off. Thursday to catch up, get all secure and stuff. All right. Let's go into this is an easy chapter. We're all going to cover this part right now. We're actually going to cover this chapter in the course of three separate classes. It is a very big domain and it's it's very impactful. This used to be three separate domains uh, before they rewrote it. What's that? Oh, okay. So page 103, if you're following along, long, long chapter. Things that we'll talk about asymmetric encryption. We were just talking about encryption. That's also called public key encryption. So you've got a public key and a private key. We'll talk about all that good stuff. That's that's fun. Hash functions. Hash functions are one way function, meaning I can't undo it back the other way. Uh, it creates as a creates a hash value. That's fun stuff too. No key. Required hypervisor, everybody's virtual now, everybody's using VMs everywhere, everybody's got hypervisors. Hypervisors is the layer that allows you to run various operating systems on one physical machine. Different types of hypervisors, we'll get to that, not tonight, but these are things to, for you to memorize. Man traps, man traps are cool, like mouse traps, but with mans. Put mans in there, put some cheese in there, I'll never get out. It's awesome. Sometimes you have a big thing come out and crush their neck. Like it? No. Sorry. Thinking about something else. Is it human life number one? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So man trap. The thing about man traps is one authentication to get in, and then another authentication to get out. Right. And so you're in the middle of these two authentications. This door will close before this door will open. There's a bunch of different ways to implement <coughs> man traps, but man traps are a good physical control. I love seeing man traps in data centers uh, because it does actually trap. People get stuck in there because yeah. they can't authenticate with the second piece. Maybe they, maybe they uh, tailgated. You know, potentially they shouldn't be able to because this door would, this door would close before this door would open. So let somebody out. You know what I'm saying? But it's uh, the other one. Wait. I love yeah, the wait ones too, yeah. right? Because wait ones are nice because then it also protects against physical theft. I'm taking something out. Like if I weighed, let's say I weigh 200. Hmm. <laughs> What? No, I'm serious. What happened if I did? So if I weigh 200 going in, I weigh 205 coming out, right? I wouldn't know the, the man trap. If it's set correctly, wouldn't let you out. You'd have a guard come and find out why you weigh five pounds more than you did when you went in an hour ago. Uh, tailgating. Tailgating's bad. I don't. What's that? Too much cheese. I like cheese. Cheese meat. Yeah, there you go. You could do that. Tailgating TCSEC. TCSEC isn't used anymore. It's, uh, it used to be part of the Rainbow Series. This is the orange book. The TNI, the Trusted Network Interpretation, is the red book. We'll go through that stuff. Uh, it is conceptual things that you'll need to memorize for the exam. This is some of the pain in the butt stuff with the exam, is memorizing things that you just don't use anymore. Symmetric encryption, very much still in use, and this is the same key to encrypt as you would use to decrypt. It's a private key encryption. It's the same thing that that's called. So symmetric encryption. We're not going to go through a lot of this stuff tonight. We'll get to this stuff in the subsequent classes, but um, all stuff that you need to memorize. So security models, there's our subject and object again. That's like the third time we've seen it, so it's very important. Um, really, it's about data flow. It's about access flow, you know, in, in many of these security models. So you can see subject um, can write up or read down or read down, write up, you know, and the various things that that means. So we'll get, let's get into this. Oh man, that's hard to see. So different access control models. Discretionary access control is just that. It's discretionary. Uh, meaning if I have the proper privileges and rights, I can assign permissions to others. I can assign access to others. Mandatory access control. There's one system administrator, policy administrator who sets up the system and that's it. There's no more changes. It's mandatory access control. Uh, many government systems, you, we, none of us use mandatory access control systems. There are very specialized operating systems that are mandatory access control systems. Rule-based access control and role-based access control. The most common 
use of rule-based access control is putting con certain constraints, like time constraints. You can log in from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., right? That would be a rule-based access control. Uh, whereas role-based access control is, is what we try to do when we set up our security groups within Active Directory or whatever, and we assign rights to specific groups based on roles. That's role-based access control, which is nice for repeatability, but if you've got the role screwed up, then you've got the permission screwed up for everybody in that role. So, you know, there's a downside to that too. Uh, different security models, these are the ones you'll just have to memorize a little bit. There's little blurbs in the book on each one of these, right? You don't need to be a master at every one of these. You just need to know, be able to conceptually put it into some kind of box. And it's a little bit hard to read. Uh, state machine model, the thing to remember about the state machine model is everything is finite states. So if I start in a secure state and all the transformations were secure, I end in a secure state. That's how that model works. It's the state machine model. Bell Lepagula is a confidentiality model. So it's no read up, no write down. Because if I'm at, you think subjects and objects, right? If I'm at this, if I'm at secret clearance level, I shouldn't be able to read up the top secret, right? That would violate confidentiality. I also shouldn't be able to write things at my level at secret down. So no write down. That's how Bell Lepagula works. Does that make sense? No read up, no write down. Bibble works the opposite way. Uh, Bibble is the integrity model. It, and they force different things, right? Bibble doesn't do anything about confidentiality. Bella, Pebble, Bella Pagela doesn't do anything about integrity. Two separate models. We'll go through that. The lattice based model is least upper bound, least uh, highest lower bound. It's a lattice framework. And that's about all you need to know. Most of these you won't ever use. Uh, what else do we have? Clark Wilson. Chinese wall, all that stuff. So these are the things you'll need to know. <clears throat> and beyond these things, I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend any more time memorizing this stuff. It's, uh, it's kind of a pain, to be honest. It's, uh, it's not just a pain for you guys having to take the exam. It's a pain having to teach it too, because it's not practical. We don't use those models, none of them. Uh, so the state machine model, so really you capture the state, you va validate that it is secure, you make these transformations into new states, the transformation itself is secure, theory would have it that you end in a secure state. So it's all about machine states all along the way uh, with the transitions in between Bell LaPagula. You'll need, you will need to memorize these properties. Uh, and they'll sprinkle something in, I'm sure, about Bella Padula because it's been around forever. I, I, this is the same thing I studied 15, 20 years ago. It wasn't practical then. It's still here. But if you think of Bella Padula as enforcing confidentiality, that would only make sense that I can't read up, I can't write data down, because that would violate confidentiality of, of the clearance level that I'm at, right? That's the biggest thing about Bell LaPagela. Uh, oh, I didn't go Biba. Lattice-based frameworks, that's, that's what a lattice looks like, but least upper bound, greatest lower bound. And I'm, a, I'm in a lattice in between, and all my objects, that the, me as a subject, I have access to fit within that lattice. Beyond that, you don't need to know anything else about lattice-based. Make sense? And it's short in the book too. There's Biba. Biba is about data integrity. You'll need to know the axioms. Simple integrity axiom, no read down and no write up, right? Because that would violate data integrity of the clearance level that I'm at. If I can write to a higher clearance level, I'm violating integrity at a, at a different level, right? Same with reading down. So essentially the reverse of Bell LaPagela. Clark Wilson. A real world integrity model. So if you remember Clark Wilson as an integrity model, I kind of highlighted the things that you'll need to memorize in the slides. So if you get copies of the slides afterwards, uh, Clark Wilson is another one of those models. So we just we just don't use it. The concept of no read down and not getting why that's important. Oh, because I can bring that data up to my level, right? Because I can write at my level. If I can read down, I can take data up. 
Does that make sense? And violate the violate integrity at my level with data that I got lower level. Does that make sense? It's not that you are a star. Well, what a different. So think of. But I mean, you would think that that should be inclusive. Of, you, know, you may not want to contaminate the two players, I guess, but that's what you mean. But it wouldn't hurt to be there because you still you should deal with it. Being the thing that, it's all about integrity. Nothing to do with confidentiality. Certified or whatever. The contamination is layer. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Logically, it makes sense. Right. No. I was just trying to understand why it would Yeah, that's the theory. I Yeah, okay. So two primary concepts, Clark Wilson, well-formed transaction and separation of duties. Clark Wilson, when it says a real-world integrity model, it was really came out of a consulting world, not as much as uh, uh, the Chinese wall, which we'll get to in a little bit, which is truly about data segregation. It's about segregation and conflict of interest. Uh, but if you just remember Clark Wilson integrity model, well-formed transaction separation of duties, you'll be fine. I wouldn't spend a ton of time using this because there's only so much like area in the, in the brain, you know what I mean? And so like if I plop this stuff in here and I don't get rid of it after the test, it's going to suck. You can just imagine me trying to go to like a client and say, hey, we need to implement the Clark Wilson model. Like, what the hell are you talking about? I'm like, don't worry about it. It's all about integrity, well-formed transactions and separation of duties. <laughs> all right, so Clark Wilson, information flow model is all about data flow. It's all about flow, and it's really not a very structured uh, model. Uh, individual, discrete, the compartments, compartmentalization, which is something we'll cover later, too. Um, yeah, it's about it's all about information flow. I mean, data flow diagrams and all that stuff would be implemented in an information flow model. It's all about clearances and labels. Brewer Nash, this is the Chinese wall. The one thing to remember about Chinese wall is just conflict of interest. We came out of the consulting world where I work at one bank and I go and work at another bank. How do I separate out and uh, make sure I don't have the same people working in both and all the conflicts of interest and stuff. If you just remember Brewer Nash, Brewer Nash, Chinese wall, conflict of interest. Those are the three things you need to remember about the Brewer Nash model. Non-interference models is all about inference attacks and covert channels. So if, uh, based on <clears throat> what I observe about a system, <clears throat> what could I infer about the system to leak data or attack data? The non-interference model is meant to uh, address that. Um, that's all you need to know. When, again, I wouldn't spend a lot of time on this. I don't want to spend a lot of time explaining it to you either because it's just a waste of your time. Take grant model is all about take and grant. Uh, take grant, create and remove. Those are the those are the rules. Interactions between subjects and objects. These are the four rules that can be implemented in the take grant model. Again, that's it. Access control matrix. We've all seen access control mat matrices before. I say that plurally, right? Analyses, matrices, sweet. Uh, where I've got the subjects and I've got the objects, right? And what kind of access do I have to each? That's that's the access control uh, matrix. That one's easiest to relate to because we've seen similar in our own work. There's a good one. The Zachman framework for enterprise architecture, <laughs> right? So it's actually six frameworks and you can see what the frameworks are. Uh, I wouldn't spend much more time on this one either, man. I mean, it's just, it's not something you're going to implement. It's good to know for the exam. Know that you've heard the Zachman framework for enterprise architecture. Know that it's who, what, when, why, where, and all that other good stuff, and I think it'd be fine. The Graham-Denning model. So the Graham-Denning model has eight rules. Uh, a little more granular, but not quite so mm, structured. Uh, but those are the those are the rules. Objects, subjects, and rules, and what they can do. Memorize that, and you'll be fine. Do you guys appreciate the fact that I'm not really wasting a lot of your time on this? Mm -hmm. Okay. Memorize the thing that's on the things that are on this slide, and you'll be more than fine for the exam. Okay. And, what you want to know is 
right? There's going to be four answers. You need to know enough about each of these to eliminate two and then look at those last two and be able to tell what they're talking about. Yeah. So how many questions, just a rough estimate, related to the security models might be down? Four to six, probably, I would guess. I don't know. Well, I don't know anymore because it's no. now an adaptive test. All right. Yeah, and, it, and that's like a lot less questions now. Yeah. Like 150 Max questions. 150. Uh -huh. Back in my day. I know, right? I did 250. I'm just six jealous. hours. I had to do that many. We had to fill in. Actually, when I took the exam, you had to fill in the holes. Yeah. Honestly, and you had to wait six yeah, weeks for your for your results. Uh, quick question. Going back, somebody said they understand no the no read, uh, but they don't understand why you wouldn't be able to write down. How does writing down compromise integrity? Writing down doesn't compromise integrity. Writing down compromises confidentiality. That's a Bella Pedula. That's not Bella. So they got it mixed up. Modes of operation, this will be on the exam too. So different modes of operation. So when a system is set up, how does it operate to enforce the security policy for the system? And the security policy is all about subjects and objects. Subjects doing what to objects. The first mode of operation is a dedicated system. A dedicated system is dedicated to one specific classification, one specific label, one specific clearance. All the objects in the system have that label, right? So if it's a top secret system, it's a top secret system. You won't find any other kind of data on that system other than top secret system, truly dedicated. The subject has to, subject has to possess a clearance level that's at least what the dedicated system's clearance level is, right? So, um, so top secret system, I need to have top secret clearance to be able to access anything on that system. That's one part of it. The second piece is I have to have that formal access approval. And chances are in a dedicated system, they'll also enforce the need to know. But you know, but the, the thing about a dedicated system is all, all the data on that system, all the objects in that system have the same clearance level. I have to have at least that clearance level as a, as a subject to access any object on that system. And I have to have a formal approval, which would be in the case, you know, they, they need to know. Does that make sense? It's a dedicated system. Second one is six system high. This has objects of different uh, levels. I need to have a clearance level equal to or greater than the highest object level label. So let's say that this system has secret and top secret data in it. I would have to have as a, as a subject top secret clearance in order to get any access to that system. That's a system high, right? So mixed labels, clearance has to be at least as high as the highest label, a system high mode of operation. Compartmented mode of operation, these are things that are placed in different compartments. Here things get a little less structured, uh, but need to know is the biggest piece in a compartmented system. Uh, subjects, so now I've got a bunch of um, might have secret, top secret, whatever. There's no restriction on what level or what clearance I need to access the data labels. It's all based on the compartments. It's not based on the system anymore. That's a compartmented system. I have to have a signed NDA. Uh, I have to have formal access approval uh, to some of the objects on the system and a valid need to know to some. So it's not that exclusive all that I had with the system high and the, uh, the dedicated system. And then multi-level. Multi-level is what we're all used to. Multi-level systems are like, you know, what we see in the, in the private sector. System contains objects of varying labels, subjects varying clearances can access the system. It's the reference monitor, which is part of the kernel in an operating system that enforces access. Uh, so when you hear reference monitor, think of kernel, it's like the, the cop traffic cop for everything in the system. All subjects have to have a signed NDA, act clearance for some, formal access approval for some, uh, need to know for some. Sounds like a company trying to make some money, right? You know that, right? Businesses are in business to make money, not to secure information. 
No matter how passionate you are about information security, you have to keep that in mind because you'll fight the business often. Right? They'll make decisions that, uh, that's why I said earlier on that the business accepts risks, not me, uh, because the business is the business. They're in business to make money. It's legitimate. All right, so TCSEC, Orange Book. Oh, crap, we're already over. All right, Orange Book is part of the Rainbow Series. Orange Book was you a way to classify systems based on how much security they could uh, essentially enforce. The government defined this Rainbow Series to evaluate different products uh, to see if they will work in their specific environments. All right, so TCSEC, Trusted Computing Platform, uh, our trusted computer security system evaluation criteria, the orange book, was used for system. The other one, TNI, the trusted network interpretation, is the red book in the rainbow series. That's for network components. So this is like operating systems, right? The orange book. Do you need to know anything else about any of those other colors? Nope, you don't. <laughs> yep, yeah, because yeah, there's all the colors, yeah, right? And you government, did you ever run into these? I don't remember. I was... Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He forgot it. Just orange. Just orange book and red book, and know that one's operating no. systems. No. Nope. But you can see there's the classification. So you'll need to know the classification. D is minimal protection. A is a system you've never seen before. It's super high security, very much validated, very much formalized, verified design, tested, accredited. I mean, it's the Windows NT, when this was the last time I remember this ever actually being used, Windows NT was the operating system out there. NT4, hey baby. NT4, the highest classification you could get an NT4 system was C2. And that's, with, and that's as long as you didn't connect it to a network. You, you have to know Truly. these too. You have to know, the, yeah, you you have like to know these. PTSD flashback. <laughs> yeah, so you know, spend some time memorizing these classifications. Uh, but, you know, in real world, we never use them. So NT was C2 until you plugged them in to the network, then it was a D. Uh, so TNI Redbook, that's the network part of it. If you want to download this stuff, feel feel free. I don't know why you would, but <laughs> if you're a history guy, if you want to do that, you, you can do it. Uh, but this is back to that certification accreditation. So I would certify a system to a C2 and then it has to be accredited by an accreditation body or an owner of the system, right? Uh, ITSEC, also not used anymore. Really, this was the European version of the orange book of TCSEC. Uh, international evaluation criteria references the orange book, but added FQ and E. Um, You'll see probably something maybe about IT sec in there, but nothing beyond what's in the slides here. More IT sec stuff. You can see the evaluation criteria. They map. So a C1 would be an F, C1, E, C1. I mean, you just have to memorize that stuff. We never use it. You know, I would have memorized this at one point, and then I would have unmemorized it, right? But you still see IT sec, and you'll have to... If this is the struggle in an exam like the CISSP is the stuff that you just kind of have to muddle through. But those are the evaluation criteria for that. The common criteria, this one was pretty, well, I don't know, yeah, a little more widely accepted. This had uh, a target of evaluation. This is the TOE. So you'd fill out a specific, uh, essentially your evaluation criteria. It'd be we want this system to be certified against this, and this is the target, this is the scope, and then you would submit it uh, for evaluation, for certification and accreditation, and then you go through these other pieces. That's the way, you know, they, they again, these aren't used anymore, the common criteria, and this is, this is the EAL. So if you see EALs, anything EAL, you think in common criteria, right? And if you want the last version, 2009, I think it's 2000 later. So why is a common body of knowledge carrying around obsolete knowledge? Yes. 
it's good conceptual information. I mean, it does drive home the point of certification and accreditation. So the where I would apply the same kind of logic in my own organization is I would define that any new piece of equipment that goes onto my production network has to meet these specific criteria and these, this specific level of testing. What we do instead is we just go buy something, we plug it into the network and, right? Yeah, we just have to do it. Some people do what? Don't have modern equipment. Yeah, maybe, maybe, but you know, in, and maybe, maybe I just, you know, in my experience, I've been more sheltered too because I've just never used any of these in practice. In 25 years, I've never, I knew what they were, I knew where to find information about it, but I never ever used it. I think part of it also is right if they're then we're building the foundation of security. So you need to know the history of it and where we've That's come true. from. The history is good to know too. Yeah, now here's where we're at. It's truly I mean every organization should have some set of evaluation criteria that they implement themselves before they plug things into the network, right? Most of us in practice maybe don't do that. So the principles still apply. You should evaluate every bit of technology that goes into your into your network and it should be Certified and accredited, you know, before you walk away from it. So the principles are still very much valid. These specific methodologies aren't as much. Let's see what else we have here. Holy crap, that's it. We made it. Yeah, you guys. I was the only one clapping. The rest of you guys are like not happy. All right, so no class on Thursday. Thursday, catch up. This is a good time because it is, it's been a lot of information. A lot of it's sort of dry, right? I mean, it's hard. I get it. It's hard to stay awake through some of this stuff. But now, you know, you've got a full week to just catch up, read through it again. Come, I really do uh, uh, encourage you guys to come with questions. Come ask us questions about things that don't make sense or why things are a separate or a certain way. Uh, I'd love to, you know, address those. And if I don't know the answer, we'll find the answer for you. Uh, but this is a great time for you to catch up. So just to get everyone here and then online that didn't see it, all the slides and videos, you can go to frsecure.com and go to the, the CISSP Mentor Program page. And there are links for the audio, the video, the slide deck, all on our site. Yeah. Fun? Yet? Yeah. I'm having a great time. This is my first fun though. Yeah. We're good. Thank you guys so much. Have a great night. So I just close this now?